Valley Church. Hope for those who have given up on church. Well, hello, everybody. Great to be back with you for our app groups uh, today. Um, we're going to talk about um, getting control. In Jerry's sermon this week, uh, Thoughtful Passion, he talked about how God's voice fixed Peter's issue on what to focus on. Since most of us aren't going to have a physical encounter with God's voice, I want to talk to you about how we can still hear from him so our passion is under control of his spirit. And we're going to read out of Romans 8, 5 to 11. So if you can turn there and join me, it says, um, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to a life, to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them, do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. All right, I'm going to talk to you about how we can do a self-evaluation and how we can take a look at this and figure out, are we being led by the Spirit? Because if we're being led by the Spirit, then our passions will always be godly passions. But we have to get ourselves into a place where we, we understand and we can be certain that we are being led by uh, the Spirit. And, and the first thing I want to take a look at uh, comes out of verse, verse 5, where it says... Um, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Um, and my question is, is really, uh, what's going on between your ears? Really, you know, that's where all sin starts, is between our ears. What we allow to go on in our mind. Um, and, and so the question is, what do you think about? What is it that when um, you're sitting alone or you're contemplating, what are, the, what are the things that are running through your head? What are you thinking about? Um, and, and that can be anything. You know, when I'm not talking about being so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I'm talking about what is it that you allow yourself to think about on a continual basis? Um, and that can be influenced tremendously by what inputs you're having into your life. If your major inputs are um, um, maybe books um, that aren't, aren't necessarily Christian books, TV um, other kinds of media, um, news programs, all of those things. Well, well, in and of themselves, they're not bad. They can become bad when they become the focus of your life. Or is your input more of godly things? You're, you're reading the Word of God. You're listening to sermons. You are, are um, processing um, what God is saying to you. If that is where your major inputs are coming from, then it becomes easier to think about godly things, it, things um, that will, will bring pleasure to him. Now, look, I understand that you cannot control the thoughts that pop up into your mind. Um, random thoughts pop up into every, everybody's mind, um, a good, bad, indifferent, whatever. The question is, is what are you doing with those thoughts? Um, do you take it captive or do you let it run wild? And that is a choice we make. You know, if a, a, a thought um, pops up to your head, maybe a, a thought of vengeance or anger pops up into your head, someone's done you wrong, or maybe years ago they did you wrong, and all of a sudden that just pops up into your head again. What do you do with that thought? Do you play it out? Do you play the scenario, I'm going to get even, um, this is what I'm going to do to that person? Or do you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, i chose to forgive. I'm going to choose to forgive again. I am not going to allow that thought to run wild in my head. That's the difference. 
See, when the spirit is controlled, you take captive those thoughts and you can end that thought. You can cut it off um, before it ever really takes a deep root. Now, look, there's a lear learning curve to this. This is not natural. This is, this is you allowing the Holy Spirit to point things out to you. Yes, it's okay to think about that. No, that's, that's going to lead you down a path you don't want to go. But you have to allow yourself to be trained by the Holy Spirit and learn how to do that. It's not natural when a thought pops into your head to say, wait a minute, that's not a thought I should think. Um, because our sinful nature naturally tends towards it. So we have to train ourselves. Wait a minute. That's a thought that I shouldn't have in my head. That's something I shouldn't be focusing on. Um, I shouldn't be um, fantasizing about that or this or whatever. We got to take it under control. And it does take some time to learning. But if we admit the possibility that we can do it, we can do it. If you, if you live your life believing you can't control the thoughts in your head, then you are going to be under their control for the rest of your life. Take the time, learn how to do it. And, and um, verse 6 goes on to talk um, about um, how being spiritually minded provides peace. And, and I put it this way, um, you have to believe he's smarter. It really comes down to that. Is God smarter than you? Um, for, the, for the spirit to be in control means you're not. That, that, that doesn't mean you don't have control of certain things of your life, but what I'm saying is you submit everything to the Spirit. There's no area of your life that you keep away from the Spirit. Um, and, and this is an act of submission. You, you have to, act, and it's not just a single act. Believe me, it's not a single act. You have to submit over and over and over again. Every time God shows you something, every time you, you, you um, learn something or receive something from God's Word, you have to make a commitment to submit yourself to what he says. So it takes an act of submission for him to be in control. Um, and and th the truth of the matter is whatever you focus on, whatever, whatever you, you're, you're passionate about, that's what you become. So if, if you are continually focusing on in your thoughts and even in your actions on evil things, ungodly things, you will become ungodly. It, it it's really that simple. But if you focus on godly things, if you keep your heart and your mind set on the things of God, you will naturally go that direction. You will become a more godly, more passionate person for godly things. Um, again, it takes some time. It takes some work on readjusting our focus. It doesn't, you know, you don't get saved one day and then you never have another evil thought. That's not the way it works. We have to conquer our, our, um, our mortal selves. We have, to, we have to bring that into submission so that we can focus on the things that God would have us focus on. Um, and and the, 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 the idea is that when the Spirit controls your mind, there's peace. Okay, and peace doesn't mean there's no problems. Peace means that you're okay. Peace means that everything between you and God is okay. Um, there, there is not a time in this life where we're going to go where there isn't issues, there isn't problems, there aren't struggles. Um, that's not what, that's not what um, Paul is talking about here in Romans. He's saying that in the midst of all of those issues, in the midst of all of those problems, there, there is the possibility of peace. And um, when you experience that peace, it is, it is a beautiful thing. It is, it's an amazing thing. You look at your life and say, everything seems like it's out of control, yet I'm okay. I'm okay with God. And that's, that's where we're headed. That's, that's when, when we can get into those places when Satan throws all of his best at us and we go, yeah, I, I acknowledge that I see all of this stuff that's going on around me, but God and I, we're okay. And when we can say that, we can, we can trust that our passions what we, what, we are, um, what we are trying to, to devote our lives to are good things. So God promises us that peace. When we, are, when we focus our minds on spiritual things, there is a promise for peace. Um, and in verse 10, 
it talks about how that, that Christ lives within us. Christ lives within us. And, and I want to make it clear, you're not alone. This, this task isn't something God ever expected you to do alone. Christ is living in you. Our job is to make sure that he can be seen in us. Some of us want to accept Christ and, and put him, you know, um, in the big toe so nobody can see him. And, and he's, not a, he, he's not available to us. Um, that's not what it is. He's, he's supposed to be up front. He is, when, when people look at us, the first thing they should see is Christ living in us. And again, that goes back to that act of submission, that, that saying, no, God is in control. Christ is going to dictate how I live my life. And when we do that, he is able to be seen in us. And, and when other people see Christ in us, it's easier for us to see Christ in us. You know, sometimes we're our biggest critics. We're the ones who tear ourselves down. We're the ones who make it hard on ourselves to live a Christian walk because we judge ourselves so harshly. Um, and we do it because we don't see Christ in us. And if we would just allow Christ to come forward and, and submit ourselves to what he has to say and what he wants for us, then all of a sudden he's, he's able to be seen, we're able to see him in us, and it makes life easier. Um, and listen, he has the power to give life to our mortal bodies. Okay, you don't have to die to conquer a sin. Isn't that, isn't that a great concept? Some of us, you know, we will have to die before sin has no hold on us at all. Okay, unless Jesus returns, um, we're going to have to die for sin not to have an effect on us. But there is not a sin that, that Christ can't conquer in your life if you will let him do it in your life. Now, some of them put up a whole lot bigger fight than others, but the, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, i.e. put life back into a mortal body, has the ability to take sin out of our mortal bodies. We are not, um, we are not to be controlled by sin. We have no debt to sin. It has no right to claim us. It has no right to control us um, if we are in Christ, if we allow Christ in us. Um, this is a fight we were never equipped to fight alone. Um, we, we, were, we were not created to fight sin. If, if, when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in a perfect garden. He didn't, he didn't put them in a place saying, okay, you're going to need to fight sin. Um, it was when they sinned, um, that they fell. And he said, okay, now I have to give you a way to, to um, fight that sin. And that way is the Spirit of God. That's that, that Spirit of Christ that lives within us. And when we submit to the Spirit of God, he fights the fight. Now, do we take an active role in it? Of course we take an active role of it. Go back to what are you putting into your mind? What, do, what, what things are you doing? Um, how are you living your life? Are you submitting it to Christ? Are you doing what God wants? That's our role. God's role is then to kill that sin desire in us. And we have to be submitted to him to that. And when we do those things, our passions become the same passions that God has. We express them, each of us express them differently, um, but our passions become the same as Christ's. And his passion is always people. He loves people. And the more we submit ourselves to Christ, the more we have the ability to love people. So in just a few moments, I hope you and your group are going to discuss a couple of questions that, that I have laid out on your paperwork for you. And um, just want to talk about them really quickly. You know, the first one, what thoughts do you need to take captive? This is, this is a huge one. What thoughts do you need to take captive? Is there fear, health, financial, sexual thoughts, revenge, um, forgiveness, whatever that may be? Think about that. What, what thoughts do you need to bring under control, under Christ's control? Are there areas in your life that show you think you're smarter than God? Are there areas of your life where you know you are actively doing something opposite or uh, against what God has said? Um, if we're honest, most of us can find certain areas in our lives, whether um, it be our eating habits, our sleeping habits, 
or something major. Maybe there's uh, sexual sin in your life or, or financial sin, whatever. We all have it, but can you be honest for a few moments and um, ask yourself, what areas do you think you're smarter than God? And, and what sin are you asking God to help you overcome? There, there shouldn't be one person, one Christian who is, that can't answer this. What, what area of your life is God working in now? Unless, un, unless you're dead, like I said, there is an area of your life that you're struggling with. Can you identify it? Because if you can't identify it, how are you ever going to get help for it? So see if you can identify that area and, and what, what area are you asking God? And then the last one is, is more of a contemplative question. I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer it. Maybe the folks around you can answer it. If someone took an honest look at your life, what, did, what would they say you're passionate about? Would, they, would, would their answer be the answer that you would want them to have? This series is really about passion and making sure that we're passionate about the same things that God is passionate about and expressing that through our lives. And if someone were to take a look at your life objectively, what would they say you're passionate about? I hope these, these questions have, have um, uh, stirred some stuff up in you and that you'll take some time and, and just um, speak to each other and allow God to speak to you. And I can't wait to come back. Uh, next time. So God bless until next time. We'll see you then.